Tonight we explore the mysterious and the unknown, from the elusive cryptids that roam hidden corners of Japan, to the haunting yokai that have terrified and fascinated for centuries. These tales are as enchanting as they are chilling. Japan's rich tapestry of legends features creatures that blur the line between myth and reality. Whether you're a believer in the supernatural or simply a lover of folklore, join me as we delve into the world of Japanese cryptids and yokai. Prepare to be intrigued and perhaps a little unnerved. Don't forget to like, comment and subscribe for more journeys into the unknown. This experience I'm about to share with you happened to my wife and I when we were in our twenties. It was a vivid, confusing and terrifying experience that we haven't really wanted to share with friends and family through fear of being laughed at and misunderstood. Over the years, my wife and I have always kind of wondered if anyone out there has seen what we have seen. I'm staying anon either way. It happened in August of 1990, and back during that summer, my wife and I were working part-time jobs. We had a carefree lifestyle compared to our current one. We were focused on saving money and putting it into savings for traveling. We traveled to Kansai on the day in question, and we were taking in the famous sights. It was something that we had always been looking forward to. We booked a nice inn for the night, and when the sun went down, we made tracks. We arrived and checked into the inn, and we were very pleased to be staying there that night. There was a really nice grove of trees outside, and our room was on the east side of the building. I was glad to have a room that would seemingly be shaded by the trees come the morning. It was the height of summer after all. We chatted for a while, took a bath, changed into yukata robes, and had dinner, and then we put the TV on. It was a really relaxing evening after a long day of walking around. As the night drew in on the first night of our trip, we decided to confirm our love for one another without hesitation. Just before that, I shut off the TV and the room went dark, but not too dark. I then opened a window and pulled across the bug screen. It was a hot night. Everything had been so great. It was the perfect beginning to our trip. Afterwards, we lay there in bed, talking. We talked for a while about what we wanted to do the next day, etc. But then my wife fell silent. I had been staring at the ceiling, waiting for her to reply. But I decided to look over to her. I guessed that she had fallen asleep. I turned and saw that she was staring at something. And then she whispered, Outside. The window. The window was just behind me, and my wife's eyes were glued to it. I looked at the TV screen. It was on the other side of the room, on my wife's side. The moon was out that night, and there was something out there. I saw it reflected on the TV. I held my breath. And my wife seemingly tried to disappear beneath her the covers, even though it was so hot. I felt sweat dripping down my forehead. It wasn't sweat from the heat, it was sweat from fear, I think. Something was right outside the screen window. I felt paralyzed, like a frog staring at a snake. I felt like I was unable to move, but then I saw the fear on my wife's face. She had a cat-like focus on the window. And that was the point where I felt like something needed to give. I couldn't take lying there doing nothing anymore. I turned on my side and I looked towards the window. And I saw something huge out there. At first it looked to me like it was a giant rocky structure. Covered in thick green moss. But that wasn't right. It just couldn't be possible. My eyes adjusted 
when I focused on it, and a face emerged from within the greenish rock. A face that had harsh, glaring eyes. Eyes that were emotionless. They reminded me of a shark's. Its face was like an ogre's, and that rocky greenish surface looked like it had just emerged from a mountain. It looked like a living mountain. Its eyes and the mouth structure looked demonic, like an oni. Hi, Jay here. Oni are evil spirits from Japanese mythology and folklore. If you look at the screen now, you can see some depictions of some. Oni are typically large in size, possess superhuman strength, and are horrifying in appearance. They're also associated with disease, calamity, and misfortune. Oni are found in countless Japanese stories and myths, where they tend to be portrayed as villains with a well-known appetite for murder and cannibalism. Back to the story. It looked like there was a huge green demonic looking creature stood outside the window. I started praying internally, praying for help from my ancestors to protect me against what I perceived to be an inherent threat. We were locked in a standstill situation. We were too scared to move, my wife and I. I was personally frightened that if I moved even my little finger, that huge hulking creature would notice and smash its way into our hotel room. We could hear its heavy, labored breath as it breathed in and out. It watched us for what felt like hours. The standoff felt never ending. If I had to guess, then I would say we stayed staring at that thing for close to an hour, if not longer. Then it took a few thunderous steps backwards. I thought it was going to leave, but it didn't. It just stood at a distance and watched for a little longer. And then, finally, it disappeared into the woods. I could hear branches snapping and trees swaying as it moved further away. My throat was incredibly dry, but I was scared to move. I couldn't even bring myself to get up and close the window. I couldn't sleep. As soon as the first light of morning came, I got up and drank more water than I've ever drank in my life. And then I looked out of the window and I saw an endless forest which led into the towering mountains. I shuddered. I started packing up our things right then and there. I wanted nothing more than to head home. In the coming days, weeks and months, my wife and I suffered with some lasting effects from seeing that creature. I personally suffered with insomnia, and when I could sleep, the nightmares, they were hellish. I would wake up with a fever, feeling bedridden at times. We're doing much better now, but we both don't really want to speak about that encounter to one another. You know, People always say that they want to have a frightening experience or see something creepy, so I guess if you are one of those people, build a good relationship up with God and start praying to spirits and your ancestors because you're going to need something, I guess. I think if it wasn't through the power of praying for someone or something to protect me, then my wife and I would have featured on a missing person report. I can still see those dark, shark-like eyes when I close my eyes. Please be careful out there. When I was a kid, about 11 or 12, I guess, I was really into building bases. I think most boys my age were. I used to build them or find them in any place I could. I managed to find a secluded spot out in the mountains behind my school. I would drag boards and mats and all sorts of other things up there to my base to make improvements on it. I had made a treehouse in a really sturdy tree. 
It wasn't a fancy treehouse, like in the book that inspired me, The Adventures of Tom Sawyer, but it was a simple one, made from planks wedged in between the tree branches. I climbed this tree many times and walked across all the planks and I was really surprised by how sturdy it was. However, when it rained, the makeshift roof would leak. Water would come through the gaps in the plywood, which was a bit of a problem, but other than that, it was a really great little base. I always expected some of the older kids in town to smash it down when they found it, but I guess my base was so well hidden that no one found it. It was halfway up a mountain, in a grove of trees, far from the trails and walkways. If you didn't know where to look, I guess you'd never come across it. So I bet you can imagine how tough it was for me to drag all that stuff up there. I was committed though. One afternoon I did something stupid. I fell asleep in my treehouse. I guess I must have been overtired from carrying all that stuff. When I finally woke up, it was almost pitch blackout. My first thought was, oh man, my parents are gonna kill me. I sat up quickly, in preparation to get up and get gone. But before I got to my feet, I heard a noise. It was a strange noise. It was an unpleasant sound. It sounded like two objects being forcibly rubbed together. I was curious as to what was making that sound, so I shuffled over to the edge of the treehouse and I looked down. I let out an involuntary scream. I was terrified by what I was confronted with. I saw a huge, white, swollen, non-human looking face peering up at me. It was climbing up the tree trunk, towards the treehouse. That horrible sound that I heard, where it sounded like things were being rubbed together, was the sound its limbs made as it climbed the tree. This creature climbed up towards me with what looked like a grin on its face. It had long spindly arms like spider's legs and a face that was huge, but it only had tiny eyes. It looked like this thing lived in the darkness. I panicked and I just jumped. I knew before I jumped I would be hitting the ground hard from a height and I was proven correct. I jarred my ankle as I landed. I think this was the first time in my life that I actually sprained my ankle. I rushed home as best I could through the woods, and I suffered many cuts, scrapes, and bruises. But that was nothing compared to the scolding I received when I got home. My parents were worried sick, naturally. I never ended up going back to my treehouse after that. I was too scared of seeing that thing out there again. I've always thought that some of the tales I heard about the mountains and the woods in Japan were, you know, kind of embellished. Something about there being things out there that have only been spotted a handful of times seemed a little unreal to me. However, when I think back to what I saw, I definitely think there is some truth to some of those stories. That creature I saw was nothing like I've ever seen in nature. I think about its long limbs and wide smiling pale face climbing up that tree after me more often than I'd like to admit. It was truly disturbing. This happened when I was in the third year of elementary school. I was about eight or nine years old. Back then I was being raised at my grandparents' home. Long story, but they were taking care of me. One day my grandparents took me on a trip into the mountainous woods to visit some shrine. We had to take a 20 minute bus ride and then get on a train for 30 minutes. And then finally we arrived at the location. 
and then it was a further 20 minute hike. I only know the distances now that I'm older, by the way. I ended up getting into an argument with my grandpa that day. I can't remember what we fell out over, but I know that it really made me mad at the time. I'm pretty sure it was over something minor or trivial, but I was so angry that I decided that I would make my own way home because I didn't want to be around him. While I stormed off thinking in my head, they'll come running over any minute, they'll be worried sick, and that'll teach him. You know the kind of usual immature thoughts you think as a child. Well, I happened to be proven wrong that day. I'm not so sure if that's because I made a couple of wrong turns on the mountain trail, but no one came rushing after me. Just in case I did get off on the wrong track, I decided to keep walking down. I mean, we went upright, so if I headed down, then I would wind up at the bottom of the trail. It made sense to me. However, once I reached what I perceived to be the bottom of the mountain, I was at a loss as to which way I should go next, left or right. I think it was around this time that I burst into tears. I felt as if I had gotten it all so unbelievably wrong, and I was going to be lost in the forest. I looked over for anything that looked like it led back to civilization, a trail, the tip of a building in the distance, anything. I didn't see much more than a thick line of trees and brush in all directions. Then I thought if I tried my best to listen to the sounds of nature, I might be able to hear a passing car or something, a stream, and then I could head in that direction I heard it coming from. I strained my ears and kept as still as I possibly could, but I couldn't hear anything. And then I heard a rustling, and I'll be honest, I was scared. Something was approaching. And then I saw something emerge from the bushes, and I feared for the worst. I expected a bear or something deadly. It wasn't a bear, though, or even anything deadly. It was a small white creature. At first, I couldn't figure out if it was a dog or a cat, but something appeared ahead of me. I looked at it, and it looked at me. There was like a moment where neither of us seemed to fear the other. I hadn't ever seen anything like that creature before. It was kind of like a cat and a dog at the same time. It slowly made off to the left and I felt the need to follow it. No matter if I walked or ran, the distance between the creature and I was never shortened. It was as if no matter what I did, I couldn't catch up to it. It maintained a perfect distance. It made sure it didn't go too far ahead or hang back enough for me to get too close to it. It made sure that I would never lose sight of it, and I think it did that on purpose. It was intelligent. I followed it, not thinking much of anything. I was a junior high school student after all. I just kind of went with it and hoped for the best. Before long, I suddenly arrived at a busy looking area, which wasn't too far away from a hospital. I recognized the area I was in. I thought it was the same place we got the bus from earlier. I remember my hallelujah moment. I shouted out loud, I know this place. After the moment I felt the most relief I had ever felt before in my life, I realized that I had lost sight of that white creature. I ran into a nearby department store and I happened to run into a bunch of kids who seemed to be about my age. I found them way more approachable than the adults in the store or whoever was in the hospital. And I told them everything that happened. They gave me bus fare and pointed me to the bus station and I was able to get back to my grandparents' area later that night somehow. By the time I got home, I found out that a search party had been assembled to look for me and I felt really bad about that. I made it home in one piece but what about that creature that guided me? What the hell was that thing? It looked to me between a mix of a Persian cat and a Spitz dog. 
but it was bigger than them. I don't know, maybe my memory is a little hazy and unreliable. Perhaps whatever gods reside in those mountains pitied me and sent something to guide me home. They wanted a foolish child like me to make it back and learn a lesson, perhaps. I've been back to that very same mountain as an adult, and I've offered my thanks and gratitude for leaving that place alive. My grandparents have passed away, and I have no cause to visit that area anymore, but I still think of it from time to time. And that strange creature, that may have just saved my life. I heard this story from a guy at my company who comes from the countryside, and I mean deep in the mountains kind of countryside. His family grows and sells shiitake mushrooms. When he was younger, he used to work there, and one of his main jobs was to patrol the mountains where the wild mushrooms grew. He said that people would often sneak out there, either to mess around and party and then inadvertently destroy the mushrooms, or they would just plain steal them. He would go out there periodically and keep watch over the place. One afternoon while out on patrol, he said that he noticed that something seemed out of place. He said that there was a shadow moving between the trees. He spotted it at a distance, and at first he thought it was a person perhaps playing airsoft or paintball or something. So he shouted out to them, Hello? Not sure if you've noticed, but you've strolled onto private property, pal. Can you please go ahead and leave? The shadow then started moving towards him, and as it got closer, he noticed that it wasn't a person. It was just a black, shadowy outline of a person. He couldn't believe what he was witnessing. The shadow even made noises as it traveled. It crunched the leaves and sticks that lay on the forest floor. He said that it was so dark that he couldn't make out any features, no eyes or anything. It was just a jet black shadow. For some reason, he didn't seem that scared of it. He said that it approached and it just passed him by. He said that he felt a slight chill as it moved past him, but nothing more. He went home and told his dad and his grandpa about what he saw. No one really knew what it was or had any kind of explanation for it, but they all ended up agreeing that it must have been something that has lived on the mountain before their family and ancestors came along. Maybe it was some kind of forest spirit or yokai. I wouldn't have been able to keep it as cool as he said he did. Just the image of a black shadow approaching in the woods is frightening enough for me. This happened when I was in middle school. Back then, my father's bedroom and mine were separated by a sliding door. It wasn't the best, but it was just life back then. I went to bed as usual one night, but for some reason, I woke up in the middle of the night. Now, I'm usually a very deep sleeper, so it was a little strange. I could see light spilling into my room from a gap in the sliding doors. I guessed that my dad had fallen asleep with his TV on again, or something. I wouldn't ever be able to get back to sleep with it on, so I decided to get up and creep into his room to shut it off. Thinking that my dad would be sleeping soundly in his bed, I entered and I saw something I still have a hard time believing to this day. His neck had elongated to the point 
that it was as long as a snake. His head was roaming around the room like a serpent, and his face at the end of it was smiling. His body was lying face down on the bed as if he was still sleeping. I was so shocked that I couldn't speak. For some reason I had it in my mind that if I made eye contact with my father, then I would be killed. So I quickly darted back into my room and closed the sliding door. It was about 3 a.m. and I had no chance of getting back to sleep after witnessing what I had just seen. Plus the light was still coming from his room. I covered myself with the futon and I hid in the corner of my room. Luckily I had a Game Boy to distract myself with. At 6am my father made his usual morning routine noises and it was bright outside. When he woke up, he would have a smoke and that morning was no different than any other. I could smell it. The smell of his smoke was coming in through the other side of the door. I approached and cautiously opened it. I felt as if everything might be back to normal. I slid open the door and I braced myself. I heard my dad say good morning and I barely noticed that I had my eyes closed. When I opened them, he looked the same as he always did. I broke out crying. I was so relieved. I told him about what I had witnessed the night before. His face showed signs of disgust, to say the least, when I told him that. He got angry at me and said that there was no way I saw what I saw and accused me of making it all up. I was all over the place. I was young. I kept asking him things like, doesn't your neck hurt, dad? And he never answered. He just got angrier and angrier. I learned that it was a taboo topic from then on. Well... I never saw that kind of thing again, and my father is alive and well. I'm not sure what to think of it all. Perhaps it was some kind of dream, but it felt so real. I just don't understand it. Hi, Jay here. The original poster here seemingly replies to a comment that I can't see. Just imagine that someone mentioned a yokai called Rokurokubi. And the OP states that that's what he thinks he saw. If you haven't already heard of the Rokurokubi, it's a type of Japanese yokai. They look almost like humans, with some differences. They say that some types of this yokai's neck stretches, and the other type, their heads detach and fly around the room freely. By day, Rokurokubi appear to be ordinary. But by night, their bodies sleep while their necks stretch to incredible lengths and they roam around freely. Sometimes their heads attack small animals. Sometimes they lick up lamp oil with their long tongues. And sometimes they just cause mischief by scaring nearby people. I have read some accounts that the heads attached to these long necks snake their way outside to eat earthworms and centipedes. Gross. Some say that this yokai isn't born a monster. Rokurokubi and their close relatives, Nukekubi, are former humans transformed by a curse resulting from some kind of evil or misdeed. Perhaps they sinned against God or nature. I find these yokai stories pretty interesting. And they're a little different to the usual kind of thing I like to put out, so if you're interested in hearing more depictions of yokai, Please let me know. I feel like with tales like this, you should probably take them with a pinch of shield. The last story was more yokai than cryptid, so it should bridge us quite nicely into some yokai descriptions. The Ningyo 
often translated as human fish, is a creature that inhabits the waters of Japan and their mythology. Unlike the mermaids of Western lore, Ningyo are described as having both alluring and terrifying features. They're often seen with the face of a human and the body of a fish. These enigmatic beings are said to bring both fortune and misfortune, with tales of their appearances dating back centuries. But what exactly is a Ningyo? And what makes them so captivating? The origins of the Ningyo legend are deeply rooted in Japan's coastal culture. Fishermen who spent long hours at sea would often recount encounters with these mysterious beings, describing them both as beautiful and eerie. Ningyo are typically portrayed as having golden scales, flowing hair, and a voice that can enchant or terrify those who hear it. Some legends describe them as harbingers of disaster, while others speak of their flesh granting immortality to those who choose to consume it. Despite their beauty, Ningyo are often seen as omens. The sighting of one is believed to foretell storms, shipwrecks, or other calamities. This duality of beauty and danger makes the Ningyo a truly unique yokai in Japanese folklore. One of the most famous Ningyo stories is that of Yao Bikuni. According to legend, a fisherman once caught a Ningyo and was curious about its taste. God, I don't know why though. He shared it with his village, an elderly man wary of a potential curse told everybody to throw the fish away and not to eat it. But a young girl named Yao Bikuni unknowingly ate it. Yao Bikuni was blessed, or perhaps cursed, depending on your viewpoint, with immortality. She ended up living for centuries, witnessing countless generations pass. Her eternal life, a constant reminder of the Ningyo's power. Eventually, tired of eternal life, she became a Buddhist nun and wandered the land until she finally disappeared. Yao Bikuni's tale is a poignant reminder of the dual nature of the Ningyo, bearers of both miraculous gifts and unending burdens. The legend of the Ningyo has persisted into modern times, influencing various forms of art, literature, and even media. From the traditional Yukioe prints to contemporary manga and anime, the Ningyo continues to capture imagination. In modern retellings, the Ningyo often embodies themes of beauty, mystery, and consequences of human curiosity. These stories explore the delicate balance between the allure of the unknown and the dangers it may inherently hold. The Ningyo's enduring presence in Japanese culture speaks to the deep connection between their people and the sea. These legends remind us of the ocean's vast mysteries and the respect that the seas command. Next, the tale of the Furaribi, a spectral fireball that has haunted Japanese folklore for centuries. The Furaribi, also known as the Wandering Fire, is a yokai that takes the form of a spectral flame. Unlike typical fires, this eerie phenomenon is imbued with a ghostly presence, making it both fascinating and terrifying. In Japanese folklore, the Furaribi is often seen drifting aimlessly through the night, its presence signaling something far more sinister than a simple fire. But what exactly is the origin of the wandering flame, and what makes it so feared? The origins of the Furaribi are surrounded in mystery. Some say that it's the restless spirit of a person who died in a fire, while others believe that it is a manifestation of all unfulfilled vengeance or sorrow. The name Furaribi itself comes from the words Furari, meaning to wander, 
and B, meaning fire. Depictions of the Furari bee vary, but common events include a small flickering flame that seems to move with purpose, often hovering just above the ground. It emits an otherworldly glow, sometimes accompanied by a faint, eerie wail. While it may appear small and harmless, encountering a wandering flame is considered a bad omen. Stories of misfortune, illness, and even death follow in its wake, adding to its fearsome reputation. One of the most famous Furaribi stories is that of a lone traveler who encountered the wandering fire on a remote forest path. The traveler, lost and seeking shelter, followed the flickering light, mistaking it for a lantern held by another person. As he followed the Furaribi deeper into the forest, the light suddenly vanished, leaving him in complete darkness. The next day, the traveler was found unconscious, mumbling about ghostly flames and a terrifying presence. The villagers believed that he had been led astray by a wandering flame, a cautionary tale to warn others about the dangers of following mysterious lights in the night. The legend of the Furaribi varies across some regions of Japan. In some areas, it is said to be the spirit of a bird that was burned to death, its ghostly flame forever wandering the skies. In others, it is believed to be a vengeful spirit seeking revenge on those who wronged it. These variations highlight the diverse ways in which the Furaribi has been interpreted and feared throughout Japanese history. This yokai continues to captivate the imagination of modern minds. Its eerie presence has been depicted in various forms of art, literature, and even in popular media such as anime and manga. In these contemporary retellings, the furaribi often embodies themes of mystery and the supernatural and the consequences of ignoring old warnings these stories serve as a bridge between ancient folklore and modern storytelling. The enduring presence of the wandering flame in Japanese culture speaks to the deep connection between the people and the spirit world. These legends can remind us of the unseen forces that may play influence in our lives and the importance of respecting the unknown. In some regions, small shrines dedicated to the Furaribi still exist, where people can leave offerings to appease the wandering spirit. These practices highlight the cultural significance that the wandering flame has created and the respect it seems to command. This legend has a kind of captivating blend of mystery fear and cultural significance. Some can read it as a warning or a haunting reminder of the past. Either way, the Furaribi continues to fascinate and perhaps terrify. Next is the legend of the Yama Biko, a yokai that echoes through the mountains and haunts the whispers of the wind. Deep within Japan's mountainous regions, among the dense forests and hidden valleys lie the domain of the Yama Biko. This elusive yokai is often mistaken for a mere echo, a natural phenomenon where sounds bounce off the mountainsides. But what if the echo you hear is not just a trick of the acoustics, but the playful response of a supernatural being? The Yamabiko is said to mimic sounds, creating the illusion that your voice is calling back to you. According to legend, the Yamabiko is a small monkey-like creature with large ears and a keen sense of hearing. It resides in remote mountainous areas, rarely seen by human eyes, 
villagers tell tales of hearing their own voices, echoing back in a hauntingly accurate manner, as if the mountains themselves were speaking. One story speaks of a traveller who ventured deep into the forest, as he called out to his companions. He heard his own voice echoing back perfectly, but as he continued, he realised that the echo was not just a reflection of his voice, but a distant, playful reply. Now imagine sitting alone by a campfire, the night closing in around you. You call out, perhaps to test the acoustics of the valley, and you hear your own voice return. But it's not an echo. It feels alive, almost sentient, almost like a reply or a response. It wants to let you know it's there. The Yamabiko is said to enjoy these games, responding to the calls of humans with a sense of mischief. Those who experience this often describe a sensation of being watched, a feeling that they're not alone out in the vast wilderness. The Yamabiko holds a special place in Japanese culture, symbolizing the mysterious and the often unexplained phenomenon of nature. It reminds us of the ancient belief that every element of the natural world is imbued with spirit and life. Even today, the legend of the Yamabiko is present, so the next time you hear an echo in the mountains, consider this. It might just be the Yamabiko answering your call from somewhere in the depths of the forests.